So thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, at this meeting. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about integrating uh, data, multiple uh, data. Metabolomic has been said to be one of those data. Just that you know that I'm coming from the metabolism field and mostly applied to cardiovascular disease and I've been only recently uh, um, going through a more uh, holistic approach, principally with metabolomics. I've not yet worked with population data, only small cohorts. So what I will do today is trying to give you an overview of the field, just that you can judge whether it's time to put metabolomics as a, in your data, and also to give you like the promises, the challenges, and also some application where people have put genetic data with metabolomics. I'll give you also some ideas of what we have done at the Montreal Art Institute since we have started to implement a metabolomic platform, and I'll come to a conclusion. So promises and challenges. Ah, oh, yeah, I have to look here. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, just to know where uh, metabolomics stands, so uh, we have uh, here whoop, the plan of the regulatory plan of uh, the cell. So you have the genome that you know with the 30,000 gene, the transcriptome, proteome, and the metabolome are, in fact, the they are viewed as being the result of the gene expression. So in this metabolome, you have a lot of metabolites, and uh, this is uh, not a defined number. So according to the Human Metabolome Database, which has been set up by David Wichert, which is one of the leader of metabolomics in Canada, the endogenous metabolite would be approximately 30,000. But this doesn't include the food additive that we have in our blood, the drug metabolites, the microbiome <laughs> metabolites. So this is a always growing number, and there's many metabolites we don't know. So the idea of metabolomics is to try to get to these 30,000 metabolites and to measure them. And what is the interesting part about metabolomics is that it, you're close, it's said to be closer to the phenotype and to the function. The metabolomic field is the youngest one of all the omics disciplines, so it has started more in the late, let's say around 2002. So it's lagging a bit in terms of, so of standardization. But it's not a new field, metabolism is not a new field because we've been screening metabolite for doing, uh, for um, metabolic inherited disease for the past 20 years. So just that, and I promise you that I have only one metabolism slide. <laughs> so it's just to give you an overview so about why we measure metabolites. <laughs> and I've taken some studies, the, some of them are very recent and are coming from the Framing Heart uh, study. It's some, uh, it was done in Boston. So we measure metabolite because they are proxies of cellular metabolic dysregulation. And lately in the 2000 and uh, there are some studies here that are in 2013. There has been a lot of study concentrating on two types of metabolites, which are the branch chain amino acid and also the acyl carnitine. So the acyl carnitine, just that you know, are metabolites you measure in blood because this is what we have access, blood, urine, uh, we can measure in air or saliva. And the acyl carnitine, they reflect metabolite acyl-CoA, which has an intra, intracellular. And once these metabolites in the cell accumulate, for example, if you have a fatty acid oxidation defect, you will get accumulation of these acyl-carnitine. Or if you have a different, some uh, dysregulation of branch chain amino acid metabolism, you'll get also different acyl-carnitine, which have odd number of carbon, as opposed to the fatty acid oxidation, which have even carbon of, uh, number of carbon. So recently, there's been all those studies which have shown that in disease like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, that these metabolites accumulate in blood. And what is even interesting about this metabolite is this is driving also new hypotheses because they have been shown to also be biologically active. And in this case, whoops. You have like a long chain acyl carnitine, which has been as a link to arrhythmia. 
the Krebs cycle intermediate linked to G, uh, agonists of GQ receptor, regulating blood pressure. You have also some of the medium chain acylcarnitine that have been linked to uh, T and uh, NF kappa B signaling. And lately, the work from Boston, they had a study where they shown that branch chain amino acid had, could be better predictive, uh, predictor of the uh, diabetes, even better than glucose. So there are some interest in using those metabolites as biomarker. These are known metabolites. There are other uh, examples in cancer, but cardiovascular field, this is the field I have followed most. But just to, so that people see the field as being metabolomics, and you, one could agree or not, <laughs> that as the, the final frontier, saying that they will be uh, used in, uh, well, they have been already used in newborn screening, but now we could uh, use it to monitor food safety, toxicology, drug discovery, uh, monitor the success of transplantation, and also disease biomarker. And I've, uh, David Wisher, that this slide on the internet, and his vision is saying that metabolomics is the field that will take over, let's say, in terms of proportionally. I would say that genomic will remain, proteomic will remain. It's only that metabolomic is lagging, and it will, uh, let's say, um, be more and more involved in integrating data. At this time, if you do PubMed, you will get 100,000 articles on genomics and 10,000 on metabolomics. So it is really lagging in terms of the, the field. So what are the challenges and the compromises? So this, this slide is a no slide. It's a 2003, but I like to uh, take this slide just to, because I think it tells all the, what are the challenges. So if we are, want to measure and define the human metabolomes, we have like three major challenges. Metabolites, we have 30,000. Let's say we have 30,000 metabolites. But these metabolites are very different in terms of chemical and physical property. You have compounds like, that you know, like glucose, lipids, but they are like uh, lipids. This is a big word, but there's uh, more than 20, 30 classes of lipids. You have phospholipids, phagomyelin, you have, and all these lipids have different properties. You have amino acid in protein, but these amino acids have different properties than the nucleotide. So every time you want to measure a class of metabolite, you need to de de develop the method to measure, and it will be a different method for every class of metabolites. And so once you buy your machine, it takes you time to develop the me the, those methods and also to validate and develop your QC. So this is one reason why the field is also lagging. Also, these compounds, they are like really present in very different concentration. You have compounds like glucose, millimolar, but you have also those interesting compounds which are more nanomolar. So it's a million, so you have to have a very high dynamic range. So often we see only the tip of the iceberg. And, also, and so then you need to choose like different methods to be able to see all those different compounds and all those different concentrations. And the two methods that have been used up to now are, let's say, uh, nuclear, nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance and mass spectrometry. And let's say nu nu NMR, it's easy to, <laughs> easier to say, NMR has the great advantage that you have like very fast sample preparation. But you see only the tip of the iceberg because it's not as sensitive as mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry, well, you can see those low uh, concentration compounds, and you can also identify them because you have the, the mass. But on the other hand, it's a more longer sample preparation, and you need to use more than one type of chromatography, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, to get the real span of all those metabolites. And the choice doesn't stop there. There's more challenges. Because let's say once you say, OK, I'll use mass spectrometry. Well, in fact, there's no universal system or approach at this time that will measure all those 30,000 metabolites. There's no one lab in the world that can do this at this time. So you have to all work together. 
And even then, you, you have, again, choices. So you have to choice whether the choice whether you will use a targeted analysis. And when we say targeted, is that we know, so it's more hypothesis driven, you know what you want to look for, so, and it will be robust, it will be quantitative, reproducible, low cost, it can be done high throughput. And so this is like a type of data we get for a profile of uh, acyl carnitine using a triple quad. So you have a nice chromatogram, you add internal standard, you know exactly which concentration, so it's very robust. But the other side, if you want to discover new metabolites, you prefer to use an untargeted analysis. So, but then this is more low throughput, it has a very, Greater, much greater potential for discovery of new molecule. But this, this is what you get. This is an example of what we have when we do non-targeted lipidomics using LC uh, QTOF. So we have, this is from plasma. So you have 21 class of lipids. You have uh, 1,500 features, because we don't say metabolite, because at this time, we don't know. We know uh, where about the, com if you have different classes, you will know where they, they, chromatic, they, they do um, elute, but you don't, have not identified all those compounds. You'll have to do a first discovery step and then a validation step to identify these compounds. So you always have to struggle and decide whether depending on the goal of your study, will you use a targeted approach or a non-targeted approach? And this will depend often on the type of study you will do. So another challenge is that the metabolites are very sensitive to environments. So I've listed here, so uh, let's say those 30,000 metabolites, all molecular weight below 1,500. So if you look at a response in time, they can vary a lot. So you have, uh, let's say, non-modifying, uh, modified uh, uh, component, like which are the individual characteristic, which will be the genetic variation. They'll be, they'll be influencing what you measure. Gender, age, adiposity, biological rhythm, environment, lifestyle, uh, whether you smoke, medication, disease. And also all those analytical variation, which I've listed here, which can be from lab, uh, technical error, the way you prepare your sample, if you have like, you have, can have batch effect, just like you had for those geos genetic studies, but with metabolomics, it's a bit, we're a bit lagging in terms of standardization. And also the data mining is, uh, let's say, there's no software that, that are given by vendor that are perfect. We all have to modify, like uh, in-house, those uh, and add uh, some bioinformatics to make sure that the data mining is done appropriately and have our own QC. So in terms of standardization, there has been a lot of work that had to be done on that side. So if we are interested, as we were this, in this symposium, we've been talking about personalized medicine. So we're interested in looking at response to drug or the onset of disease. It is most important that we think about the sample collection procedures, storage, and batch effect. I think these are the main, uh, assuming that all the an other analytical variation have been taken care of. I think as of today, from my experience, this remains a challenge when we do clinical study. So in terms of defining the human metabolome uh, and trying to understand better the impact of genetic and environmental factor, there has been in the uh, last few years some study which have tried to link the GWAS and the metabolomics. And there has also been some population and cohort study in Europe and uh, one of which is a cohort in uh, Germany, Augsburg, and one is the UK cohort. So in the population and cohort study, uh, you can see that where this, the field is. So we have, in one case, they measured two, uh, 212 metabolites. So we're very far from the 30,000. But they did this at, what was interesting with this study, they had like uh, over 800 healthy subjects, and they did the, uh, two measurements, seven years apart. And what was so interesting is, although we think the metabolome is very variable, for those 212 metabolites, at least, because this is a very small portion, 
After seven years, they could identify 40% of their subject just based on the metabolic phenotype. So it is variable, but everyone has his own metabotype for certain metabolites. And in this other study, which is where they had 1,200 subjects, they measured uh, four ta over 4,000 metabolic feature because they had non-targeted approach, which would be equivalent to about, what, 1,500 metabolites. So in this case, it was, uh, it's an interesting study because they were calcul had power calculation to know how much uh, subject you would need to be able to discriminate your population for age, sex, to be able to know more about those phenotypic characteristics. So this is about the size of study that we see in the literature at this time, very far from your core genetic cohort or big data cohort. But this other study, the, the MGWAS, which is a combination of metabolomic and GWAS, there have been a few studies. This is the most recent one, where they had uh, uh, almost 8,000 subjects. They measured 529 metabolites. They had 299 SNP metabolite association at 145 low C. And I think this can tell you a little bit more because you're more from the genetic field. So what they did is trying to link the genome and the metabolome. And in this paper, they had what was interesting. They had this, uh, those metabolic association illustrated as a chromosome map of low C. So they could associate some low C with all the metabolism. So depending on the color, it was a different metabolic pathway. And this then they use bioinformatic tool to uh, try to separate those, uh, those associations according to whether they could be used in drug target or as an inborn error or as, um, whoops, I can't read, sorry. But all those that are in bold are new associations that they had not previously identified. So they could link this low side to a, a, a given enzyme in a metabolic pathway, which they had not been able to do before. So this is like a new, there's I've been, I think, three or five studies like that, and they've just been increasing the number of metabolite and uh, low side, but I think this is a very uh, growing field. So second part, just a few slides to tell you what we've been doing at the Montreal Art Institute. So. I've been introduced to doing like this more holistic approach, metabolomics, as I was trying to move towards more translational research because I was a basic researcher working with mice and uh, doing some measurement of metabolites, like just profiling of a few metabolites. And so we're trying to start, and with GCMS only, and I was using like very, whoops, <laughs> very basic statistics like t-test, and then I've been considering using human study and doing metabolomics with, because we got a, a, a CFI, so it was a great opportunity for me in our institute. And so we developed, like we uh, bought, bought LCMS and developed targeted approach for more metabolites and non-targeted approach for all the lipidomics, which is 2,500 feature. And I was introduced to the multivariate analysis and this has been like a lot of challenge for me, but uh, very interesting and very, uh, and I've just realized that I've changed a mouse um, for another mouse <laughs> because now I don't have a mouse, but I do use my computer a lot. <laughs> so, so these are examples of, and all the, the example I've chosen is more to illustrate how we have dealt with some of the challenges. So we have a biobank at uh, the Montreal Art Institute and uh, I don't know if David, ah oh, yeah, the director is there, David Busset. It was uh, started by Jean-Claude Tardif, and you know probably a lot of study by Marie-Pierre Dubé, that a uh, more genetic study, about 20 uh, papers were published, but not so much like study involving measurement of metabolites, and they have been two because at the beginning we start about, we think, thought about the protocol, the sampling protocol, so that it could apply to metabolomics, so taking care of how we would sample the patient. So we did two studies up to now, 
One was uh, to validate a frequency questionnaire, so it was to evaluate fatty acid intake by the group of Guillaume Lett, and Valérie is here too, so. <laughs> and this was a very interesting, because then this validating this questionnaire for omega-3 fatty acid enabled uh, Valérie now to use these, the, this questionnaire to be able to do our, our genetic study. So that was like a, a study involving a couple of hundred of patients. But it, because we had uh, gathered uh, the red blood cell, it was possible to do this because this is a marker of your fatty acid intake. And the other one we did was in heart failure patient to measure levels of fatty, again, fatty acid and also marker of oxidative stress. So in fact, what was important in that case is that we had to think ahead about what, how we would sample, the, the, how the sampling should be done so that the metabol that when we store it in aliquots, that don't, you ha don't have to tar on tar, because this is the thing which can influence a lot metabolite level. The two other projects which i like to talk about very shortly, one is uh, the, uh, a project we had, and uh, it's a, a part of a consortium project. It's the Lee uh, syndrome French Canadian type. And uh, Lee syndrome French Canadian type, we had this consortium, which is created in 2007, it's a multidisciplinary research effort where we want to translate gene discovery into treatment for a patient. And LSFC is commonly uh, said to be lactic acidosis. For those who are from Quebec, know Pierre Lavoie, because Pierre Lavoie, I don't know, maybe some of you have done the Grand Défi Pierre Lavoie, where it's uh, every year we get this event, which is a thousand kilometer of biking, and he's the one who has uh, initiated this foundation, Grand Défi Pierre Lavoie, because his two kids, two of his four kids died of this syndrome. It's a monogenic mitochondrial disorder, uh, and it's a uh, very, a um, lot of morbidity. The, the kids die very early, very young from crisis, and we don't know nothing about what initiate those crises. And it, this disease was first described in 1993, and it's prevalent in the northeastern region, Saguenay, the, the, the region we talked about yesterday. And it was uh, by the group of uh, Morin et al, he's a pediatrician. And this disease is characterized by a tissue-specific decrease of one of the complex of the mitochondrial transport chain, cytochrome oxidase. And they, following the description of this uh, disease, there was like a big run to try to identify the gene. And uh, because uh, uh, Pierre wanted to have this gene screen in the population, and so uh, in this gene discovery was involved uh, Vamzi Muta, but I was sitting bef beside uh, Thomason yesterday and he told me all the story behind this gene discovery because he was also involved and John Ryu was also involved. But when they discovered this gene, leucine-rich pentatricopeptide repeat containing uh, gene, no one knew what this gene was doing. So we had the gene, we could screen for it, but they didn't understand what was this gene doing. So there was like this quest to try to understand better the role of this gene, and that's where uh, John Ryu, who was the geneticist working just one floor behind uh, top of me, decided to come and ask me, well, can we do something about it? So we uh, sort of formed this team and applied for a CIHR Emerging Team Grant that we got for five years. And among the study we did, we did like a metabolomic study to try to understand better what was the impact of this gene mutation, which is, in fact, there's one mutation uh, in this gene at uh, the position 354, uh, and there's uh, one, one that all of them carry this mutation, all the patients, except one that carry another mutation, a stop mutation. So what we did is that we did like a prospective study because what we, you know in genetic disease, we have very few patients. They are geographically located very apart and they are fragile. So you don't want to sort of push them into any uh, very difficult situation. So we work with the parent association and we uh, included all the living patients, there's nine, 
And knowing that met metabolomic can be subject to a lot of variation, we paired those subjects prospectively with some control, which had been genotyped and matched for sex, age, BMI, and physical activity. And we did the sampling at home. We had a mobile unit, but not as big as the one you saw yesterday for the MRI. It was a car <laughs> with the centrifuge, 20 kilo of uh, dry ice. And, uh, and so they were going at home to do the sampling. They were, sampled, uh, they were sampled at fasting and after a smoothie challenge, which was standardized. And also we took urine sample. So the first part of the study, we did analyze those uh, fasting plasma and urine sample on, in two distinct platforms, and they give two data sets. One data set came from different platform in Quebec, so we had the clinical uh, biochemic, standard clinical biochemical parameter done by Biron Laboratory, because we wanted that uh, everything was the same. And we did a mix of platform, of Montreal Art Institute and Sherbrooke to get, have more metabolite. And we also went to uh, ask Vem Simuta, who had been, this, was very interested in this study because it was a follow-up on his gene discovery. So we did the rest in Boston. So total 407 metabolites were measured, 49 were common on both platforms, 13 class of metabolites, so amino acid, organic acid, and then we from the, we did some quality control and then some analysis. And what we saw from the two platform, we were pretty impressed to see the PCA plot, so I don't have to uh, explain to you the PCA plot since the last speaker did it so well. So uh, we, we got like a separation on the x-axis, which we didn't expect at all, because this is non-supervised, so we just tried, we put the data in and pop the two, uh, there was a very distinct metabolic signature that would separate the control and the LSFC in red. And you see the it, uh, compound heterozygote is with the patient. And we did the loading plot and score plot and everything, but we did also the permutation tests, which because we had pair our subject for, control, for age, sex, so we would analyze and consider this pairing. And I won't pass a lot of time on this one, but it's just to show you that we had these results from two platforms. All the little circles represent the subject. And this is a log two, and it's express control, uh, patient versus control. And not, not, ex as we expected, there was a signature of mitochondrial dysfunction, which is like increased NADH because the electron transfer chain doesn't function also changed as indicated all by the red arrow, but there was also change in mitochondrial process like beta oxidation and Krebs cycle. But there were also unexpected findings. They were also like a, a change in the cardiometabolic risk. They, it, it, it was as if even those patients were young, they were between six and 30 years old, they had a, very, they had a high cardiometabolic risk also, there were some, um, some metabolites that we did not expect, like those of beta oxidation, which up to now we are looking for to try to explain them. Some in amino acid that are known marker of neurodegeneration, which is a characteristic of this disease. So we are also pursuing on this. So it, overall, we were let's say this led to uh, more generating, it was generating additional hypothesis. So in, in a way, this was the first prospective comprehensive metabolic profiling study in a small genetically defined patient cohort because most other studies before I've used sample from cohort already established. It's a uniform, it's very genetically defined. So the, in fact, our result, I think it's a proof of concept, but at the same time, it highlights the power of using a robust study design and combining it with metabolic profiling. It could be used in other genetic cohorts. The metabolic signature that we saw, 45 compound total, so give us some insight and is driving new hypothesis. And now we're doing the non-targeted uh, non lipidomics to add to this further characterize this signature. And this approach may be used also in, uh, for study, trying to, if you do it longitudinally for biomarker discovery or for monitoring drug intervention, which doesn't exist for those patients. 
So the last two or three slides is uh, my first uh, study, which is more involved with personalized medicine. And now I've shifted from um, cardiovascular disease to in inflammatory bowel disease. <laughs> so we were talking yesterday about reinventing ourselves all the time. So this is a way to survive. So metabolism is also an inflammatory bowel disease. So this um, is um, the iGenomed Consortium project. So it is being founded by uh, Genome Canada, Genome Quebec, and Genome British Columbia, and the uh, Foundation, uh, Crohn and Colitis Foundation, CIHR, and FR, FRQS. So this um, is a, a big project led by John Riou and Alain Bitton. And we are 12 co-applicants. It's pan-Canadian, so many people involved, different people, on, and uh, socioeconomic benefit, our molecular biologists, clinicians. So it's uh, very uh, multidisciplinary. And the goal is to translate the genetic discovery into personalized approach to the treatment of these disease. And it all started. Uh, with the um, discovery of loci 163 by Justin et al. So I saw it was in the previous uh, presentation, talked, uh, pre previous speaker talked about this, uh, this uh, Justin. So they identified 163 loci, and this is driving all the project, thinking that those loci are determinant in, uh, for this uh, patient population in their way they, they respond to therapy. So it, I will just summarize briefly, but from these loci, they've been selecting 356 genes, and there is a, a part of this project where there is a system biology approach where they're using cell and overexpressing and knocking down all these genes, looking at readout to find out what is the, the function of these genes. And this is, in fact, driving the clinical tests that will be used to, in patient court to try to identify candidate biomarker which could predict the response to treatment. And specifically, the first cohort that we'll be using is an anti-TNF therapy cohort, which is also pan-Canadian, so multi-site. And so where I've been involved is in the clinical assay. So in there, there's histology. There's proteomic, there's also cell-based assay using immune cells, and there's metabolomics. So just two slides, I think, to show you our ch the challenge that we had to deal with. First was to agree on the way to collect plasma, <laughs> because all the site, we were saying, well, we need to be uh, standardized this, and everybody, we said, well, we need to centrifuge rapidly, collect on ice, and this has been a very difficult thing to uh, implement. And so we had to, uh, so finally we agreed, we did video and we agreed to, uh, that all the side would collect, put their sample on ice immediately and centrifuge within 30 minutes. And in fact, even that, even with that, we had to implement like QC so we could uh, monitor the quality of the sample we will receive. And this is a result, we did this with just a rapid an, uh, organic and amino acid analysis by GCMS. And this is again a principal component analysis. And if you look in blue and, gray, and gray, this is when you put the sample on ice. And those uh, uh, yellow and red is when you don't put the sample on ice. So ice, everybody has ice, so if you put your blood sample on ice immediately, even if you wait a little bit to centrifuge, this is, uh, you get a much uh, better quality. And in fact, what's deriving here, the difference is lactate, not surprisingly, because if you leave the red blood cell, they do glycolysis from all the glucose which is in the blood. So if you monitor just a few metabolites, you can immediately know whether a given site has not really uh, handled the sample correctly. Because you don't want at the end to have a, a PCA plot, but this will just say where the sample were collected. You want to identify biomarkers. So that, this has been one first challenge. The second one was which metabolite to measure. Because let's say they, you don't, they don't want untargeted, that's too much metabolite, and this will de decrease power. 
So, and if you say, you cannot just pick one or two metabolite because every time if you pick a metabolite, you have to develop the method and it could take forever and there's not enough money to do a development. So we did it two way. We seek the literature, found that there were energy metabolism, inflammation, microbiome, but we did also a pathway uh, analysis. So we tried to develop a bioinformatic tool to try to use the gene as entry and predict which metabolite should be measured and then selectively develop the method this way. And this tool, uh, which is being developed uh, by Sarah, who is also in the room, and in collaboration with Guillaume Lett and uh, John Ryu, is a tool that uses uh, queries from database like KEG, and then uh, using like a, a model which is based on distance between metab uh, reaction, is, is mapping those genes to the KEG metabolism. And this is the KEG metabolism overview with the IBD gene. So there were 16 enzymes, 19 metabolic pathways, and three solute transporter from the, the 295 genes that were selected. And this is now sort of will guide us in the choice of our uh, metabolite to be assessed. And we're now try validating this predictive model using the MGWA study, because this will tell us whether we have a good model. Well, so in conclusion, so I would say that it's a uh, metabolomics in an emerging omics discipline, and it aims at measuring all metabolites, 30,000. Up to now, well, if we look at studies, we see 5%, so we see the tip of the iceberg. But uh, there's a lot still that needs to be done. But I think, nevertheless, uh, measuring the metabolites reveal phenotypic change that are not depicted by other omics approach. It, they are, uh, the field is ready for some high throughput analysis of a large number of samples. You've seen a thousand, so it's not exactly what you are doing, but still, a thousand can be uh, useful. And also, you've seen as much as a thousand five hundred metabolite being measured, so then it's ready to be combined with other omics. But this application requires rigorous and well planned study design and workflow but also combining multiple platforms. So I think in the field, more and more, they have, people have to work together to put all the platforms together to get more metabolites. So it will need standardization. So I'd like to acknowledge, uh, so here are the, the member of the lab and the metabolomic platform and all our collaborator and also the founders. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christine. Uh, we'll take one question. Okay, I'll ask it really quickly. Uh, you showed a, a really nice proof of concept before with the lactic acidosis study. Is there, uh, before you're moving on to reinvent yourself, is there more coming down the pipe in that context as well? Uh, in this type of, well, now we would like first to, uh, well, we've uh, submitted a grant mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, work with people from St. Justine. Uh, I see uh, <laughs> uh, with um, Catherine Brunel Guitton, where they just uh, there was the uh, uh, inauguration of a mitochondrial uh, unit. So we try to work with them to do like their genotyping, their patient for because the thing is that with these patients, not all, many of them has been genotyped. So we have people that have a phenotype that match a little bit people with the Lee syndrome but we don't know which gene. So they have first to be genotype. And so we've sort of uh, asked them that when they get the genotype, so we will sort of use them to try to see, because we don't know, this is LRPPRC, so we don't know if this signature applies to all mitochondrial disease. And we would like to also expand the number of metabolites and do a longitudinal study, of course because otherwise you can't, you don't know anything. And I have more uh, phenotypic characterization of the phenotype, the disease, of se the severity of disease. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, let's thank all of our speakers for this one.